Well, hey there, all you cool cats and kittens. Yeah, no, I had to. I'm sorry. But also, we're talking about Flannery O'Connor today, and a good man is hard to find. And I'm sure that um, dear old Flannery would, would have a hoot with a, well, I won't even reference the name. Don't watch that show. Rot your brain for eight hours straight or whatever. Anyway, um, how are you guys doing? Thanks for uh, filling out the questionnaire for those of you who have. And sorry again that I didn't have on there a question to put your name down. I kind of thought it just, that was part of the form um, in Google, but it's not apparently. So, um, but I was, uh, I was reminded of Tiger King because somebody mentioned it in there. Um, uh, the things that uh, quarantine will do to you. Anyway, i um, excited to talk to you about Flannery O'Connor today. As I mentioned in um, one of the emails, um, I think that she is certainly, and actually it was in a video, but anyway, I think that she's certainly uh, the greatest or one of the greatest um, Christian writers of the past century or so. Um, certainly one of. And what makes her interesting is that she's not at all the kind of thing that one would find at a, uh, unfortunately, at a uh, Christian bookstore, which I guess those aren't really a thing anymore, but back in the 90s, early 2000s, um, you know, those are the places where you would buy, quote, Christian literature, or well, Christian fiction. And, um, and this is a good starting off point because that's not at all what Flannery O'Connor is. Um, but before we get into that, uh, I'll talk to you just a little about her in general. Um, and then get on to A Good Man is Hard to Find. Uh, as I said, your, um, your forum posts have been awesome. Seriously, I'm just, I'm blown away um, reading them, both by your insight and by the hard work you've put into reading and understanding uh, deeply um, these difficult works. So, good job. Um, yeah. And, and again, I can't respond to... Uh, 45 people's uh, forum posts every week. Sometimes I'll jump in, but mainly I'll kind of respond in a sort of summary fashion to all of you via uh, video or in emails. Okay, Flannery. Man, what a great uh, little woman. And I mean little in the sense that she was um, thin and, and all that, and not uh, as a diminutive. She's Southern to the core, raised and born in bred in Atlanta, outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, actually, a couple summers ago, I was doing a film project outside of Atlanta, and I took an afternoon to go to her um, home, which is now a museum. It's a farm, and um, she lived there basically with her mother and some people that worked on the farm, and she raised peacocks. And the, the first thing that you need to know about Flannery is that she was... Um, even though she was, I'm sure on the surface, sort of a sweet Southern, um, quiet, reticent woman in, in public settings, she was relentlessly and ruthlessly committed to uh, the truth and to her art in writing. I don't have it with me. I realized I left it in my um, office at, at NCU Bushnell, uh, but I there was recently published her prayer journal, which wasn't intended for publication. It was literally her journal from when she was just out of um, college and she was in, um, she was in college, but she was done with her uh, undergraduate and she was doing an MFA at the prestigious Iowa Writers Workshop. Um, and it literally is just her journal, her prayer journal. And in it, she says things like, oh God, you know, make me, make me a good writer. That's all I want. And um, another time she, she prays, she says, I pray that Christian principles might permeate my writing and that there would be enough of it published for them to permeate. Um, and these are just examples of how intent she was on um, somehow elucidating the truth within her writing. Um, she was hilarious, uh, often ironic. Uh, but charitable, you know, you might read some of these descriptions and we'll, we'll get more as we read the different stories. But for example, in the good man is hard, to, a good man is hard to find the grandmother and the, you know, the store owners and some of these other people, they don't come off as real attractive characters to us reading now. And, but Flannery 
isn't somebody that's just trying to bring people down at all. Um, especially those who are what might be considered, you know, backwards or ignorant by big city or n northern um, judgments. Instead, she's trying to hold up a clear mirror to the reality of what people are like, especially those who are um, more self-righteous than they have a right to be. Um, and we see that in this story. We'll see it more in the others. Um, now, as I said, she's ruthlessly committed to reality or the, the truth, and that's as opposed to what she might term, and forgive me, but what she might term nice-sounding horseshit or something, right? Um, for example, her second novel, which is a wonderful novel, and I, I chose to do some short stories instead of this novel, um, but it's called The Violent Bear It Away, and that's a quote, I'm sure many of you recognize it, um, from a part of a verse in Matthew chapter 11. Um, and it says that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent bear it away. Now it's in context. It's, it's not saying, you know, God loves violence or something like that. But, it, but it's getting at the idea that, you know, either this, and you know, to quote the misfit, either this whole thing is true or false. You know, there's no in between. And um, as the misfit says, and not to get ahead of myself in talking about the story, as the misfit says, like either, either Christ raised the dead or he didn't. If he didn't, then it's all hogwash and let's just leave it aside. Once for all, just you know, not deal with that. Um, but if it is true, then that ought to upend your entire reality and change every, everything about you. Um, and that's very much Flannery. And so the book's called that. And, um, there's, you know, a quote comes to mind from that novel. We're not reading that novel. I don't want to confuse you. I'm just trying to give you an intro to Flannery. Um, there's a quote in that novel where there's, there's a kid with Down syndrome um, that the main protagonist, who's by all accounts running from God and trying to avoid his calling, um, not in the NCU sense, but his calling to be literally a prophet for God. He's trying to avoid that. He's running from it. And he ends up running into this kid with Down syndrome, um, whom he has an overwhelming, obsessive uh, feeling of compulsion to baptize this kid. Um, anyway, but this kid is uh, a, the son of uh, his uncle, who is a psychologist and who is everything that Flannery is opposed to. Everything's in, quote, in his head. And he's all about, you know, um, nice words and like the best sort of, um, here's how you raise a child, but like not really getting his hands dirty, literally or metaphorically. And there's a line in there where um, an old guy says to this psychologist uncle who's the dad of this Down syndrome kid, quote, you can't change a child's pants in your head. And pants means diaper, you know. You can't change a kid's diaper in your head. You know, there, you have to encounter the physical reality of the situation and deal with it. Um, you know, what does that have to do with, with Flannery as a writer? Well, she's deeply sacramental, namely that she's not about, um, you know, quote, highfalutin philosophy. Uh, she's about the reality of the incarnation. That is the... Um, the become, you know, God becoming man in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, so a, a final sort of anecdote to give you a little more of an idea of Flannery before we move on to the story itself. So she's, you know, as I said, a Christian, she's a Catholic specifically. Um, and therefore, well, therefore believed in the quote, real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. So many of you who are Christians have experienced taking communion. You know, you, as you know, Christ said in the night before his death, he broke bread, he gave thanks, he broke the bread. And this was the Passover meal that the Jews would be celebrating. If Jesus was a Jew, if JC was a Jew, uh, sorry, let me quote, which actually came up in our virtual happy hour that we had with family um, a couple of nights ago, oddly enough. 
JC, JC was a carpenter. Yeah, I just figured why not follow the best. Name that movie quote without Googling it. And yeah, I cut my finger on it. I'm doing home remodeling stuff. Name that movie quote and you get uh, bonus points. Get back up. Anyway, so is the Passover in crisis is celebrating Passover uh, with his disciples. He says, you, you know, and the, the tradition would be to, to eat this unleavened bread and to drink this wine together um, during this meal. But he says, and this is before he dies, eat this, all of you. This is my body, which will be given up for you. And then he takes the chalice after supper, giving thanks. He says, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, which will be shed from you. You know, it's a new and everlasting covenant, whatever. And he says, do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Anyway, um, as, you know, as a Catholic, Flannery would have believed in the real presence of Christ in, in the Eucharist, that even though it remains bread and wine, um, that that's actually the body of God, the body of Christ that you eat, that you take into yourself and that mixes on a molecular level with your own body. Anyway, it's a physical reality is where I'm going with that. So the anecdote is this, you know, there was another Catholic writer at the time in the 50s, 60s, when Flannery was young and just beginning to be a rising um, literary light in the world. And this other author, if I'm not mistaken, was Mary McCarthy. But she had renounced her faith and was no longer, you know, not a Christian, not, you know. Um, but they were both happened to be at a, a sort of um, fancy dinner party for writers and artists and things together. And Flannery, very uncomfortable in, in that kind of situation. She's literally a farm girl um, from a small town in Georgia, uh, is sitting quietly and listening. And Mary McCarthy, the socialite, is going on and on. And she says, she begins to talk about the Eucharist, about communion. And she says like, oh yes, I mean, of course one doesn't believe anymore that there's anything real to this, you know. Um, but it's, it's beautiful imagery, isn't it? And she says, you know, but uh, you know, it's beautiful symbolism. And um, I just think, uh, you know, that one can still use the beauty of um, you know these various tropes that one finds in the Christian faith as a sort of symbol of whatever I, I was there, and, and it's not recorded. Uh, but then, uh, then Flannery, who's been silent and uncomfortable the whole time, pipes up in an awkward and kind of abrasive way, and she says, "Oh no, no!" Somebody turns to her and says, "Well, what you, you, you're a Catholic, um, right, Flannery? Well, what do you think?" She's been sitting silently the whole time. She says, well, if it's a symbol, then to hell with it. Namely, if there's not some reality to what's going on, if it's just a bunch of nice sounding or kind of beautiful abstract um, ritualistic actions, then to hell with it. At any rate, that's the Flannery that we're encountering in this story as the, the author. And I think that it's instructive for how to Deal with it. Of course, I can't, you know, go into every little bit of the story or address all the things that have been written thus far in the forms. And again, um, as we said, the goal is to finish writing your forum post, a reaction forum post, by the the next class period. So we read um, "Good Man Is Hard to Find" for Thursday, and so before tomorrow, when you read "The River" by Flannery, um, try to make sure you get your response to the uh, forum post up. At any rate, I can't respond to them all, uh, but it was interesting to see some of the tracks that they went down, you know, talking about, um, and I'll start with this, that, that Flannery was saying, well, you know, morality is gray. Now, I think I get what you're saying, and there are, you know, different, a variety of people saying different things along those lines, because certainly you're, you're onto something as far as the grandmother thinking, right, that she's... Um, better than other people and being self-righteous and kind of looking down her nose at a variety of other kinds of people, including the misfit. Um, but to say that morality itself is gray is actually, I'd say, diametrically opposed to what Flannery is doing here and certainly to what she believes. Uh, so, so let's dive into it. Uh, the, the crux of the story, and we'll try to just beat through this pretty quickly. The crux of the story, page 152, is the ending. Everything's been built up to here. And, you know, the misfit and the grandmother have been having this conversation. Most of the others have already been shot. And um, 
So I'll pick it up there on 152. There were two more pistol reports and the grandmother raised her head like a parched old turkey hen crying for water and called, Bailey boy, Bailey boy, as if her heart would break. And Bailey is her son. And that's, that's key to remember for what's gonna happen next. Um, so she's crying out for Bailey and that's a natural, obviously a natural emotion to love one's children, to feel, you know, to identify one's own um, self with, a, with your child, that you know, what's good for them is what's good for you. Okay, that's a natural love, right? Okay, going on. But, but the misfit, almost as if he's ignoring her, just keeps on going. Jesus was the only one that ever raised the dead, the misfit continued, and he shouldn't have done it. He thrown everything off balance. If he did what he said, then it's nothing for you to do, but throw away everything and follow him. And if he didn't, then it's nothing for you to do but enjoy the few minutes you got left the best way you can by killing somebody or burning down his house or doing some other meanness to him. No pleasure but meanness, he said, and his voice had become almost a snarl. Um, so the misfit gets right down to the crux of the issue, as I was saying. Um, either Christ raised the dead and, and himself rose from the dead, or it's, it's all meaningless. But if he did, then God walked among us once. And if he did, then that changes everything. And um, then what does he say? Then there's nothing to do but throw everything away and follow him. But if he didn't, then there's nothing to do than enjoy life and whatever you can. And of course, we'd say, well, it doesn't have to be killing people, but there's no real argument against then. Um, you know, if there's no theological element in the universe, then there's no real argument. And, I, and this is a lar larger philosophical um, conversation in, in Kincaid. We'll, we'll talk about the um, counter arguments and rebuttals later. Um, but there's no real argument without an, a, an infinite reference point. I mean, Sartre made this point. Without an infinite reference point, life is meaningless. Of course, he you know, came to a different conclusion. And of course, one would, you know, the, the, the trope, that says, well, you know, I don't have to believe in God not to be an asshole. You know, that goes around a lot. Well, of course not. But you don't really have a great argument against somebody who um, thinks the way that the misfit does, other than to say, well, you know, it's an aberration and we should eliminate it. Fine. I agree. It, you know, using that, um, that worldview. But, but the point is, um, that's the thesis that the misfit slaps down. And he says that, I wish I'd been there. I don't have any proof one way or the other, right? Um, and this is, you know, I'm not just making this up that this is central to um, a Christian worldview. Uh, those of you who are familiar with, with the Bible know, um, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, right? Um, Paul is writing to these people, the Corinthian church, who... You know, some among them are saying, well, you know, maybe it's kind of a metaphor. I mean, of course, like nobody rises from the dead. And so like, you know, it, the, the spirit of Christ lives on in us, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and Paul addresses that head on. He, he says, um, I'm paraphrasing, well, you know, kind of quoting, kind of paraphrasing. He said, if Christ isn't risen from the dead, then we are of all men most to be pitied. We are of all people most to be pitied as Christians because you know, I've been persecuted, beaten, you know, shipwrecked, imprisoned, falsely accused, all these things, because I'm saying, like, no, literally, not, not kind of, not metaphorically, but literally, um, this man who claimed to be God rose from the dead uh, and has spoken to me, you know, therefore, um, I believe that it's true. And if that didn't happen, so he says, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has risen from the dead. You know, he goes on. Uh, the, the point is, it doesn't do to bandy in half-truths. Like, just be done with it, right? Or believe that it's true and make it your everything. Uh, and this is the argument that the misfit's making. And then it goes on. This is kind of interesting because the old lady that we all, you know, love to despise in the first, uh, well, you know, she's not that lovable. She says, maybe he didn't raise the dead. The old lady mumbled, not knowing what she was saying and feeling so dizzy that she sank down in the ditch with her legs twisted under her. She, she, she has doubt, but she's coming to her crisis of identity um, and belief right now. And the misfit goes on. I wasn't there, so I can't say he didn't, the misfit said. 
I wish I'd have been there, he said, hitting the ground with his fist. It ain't right I wasn't there, because if I'd been there, I would have known. Listen, lady, he said in a high voice, if I'd have been there, I would have known, and I wouldn't be like I am now. His voice seemed about to crack, and the grandmother's head cleared for an instant. This is the climax of the story, so pay attention. Her head cleared for an instant. She saw the man's face twisted close to her own, as if he were going to cry, and she murmured, Why, you're one of my babies. You're one of my own children. She reached out and touched him on the shoulder. The misfit sprang back as if a snake had bitten him and shot her three times through the chest. Then he put his gun down on the ground and he took off his glasses and began to clean them. Okay, so what's happened here? A few things have happened. The encounter with the misfit has enabled the grandmother's profession of faith. Of course, it's not some, you know, creedal, you know, long creedal uh, declaration, but the sum of the gospel, the sum of all, you know, Christian belief is to love. And, I, and that's, man, been misused a lot um, in recent times, which it's not a namby-pamby, uh, vague sort of thing. She loves her enemy here, right? At the end, and what does that mean? She, as I was saying, she sees suddenly this serial murderer as her own child, and she reaches out and touches him on the shoulder. That is the, um, that's a distillation of what love is. She sees and identifies herself, first of all, with, but also sees this person as infinitely valuable, as those of you who have kids understand what I mean there. She sees the misfit. This is, you're my own baby. You're one of my own children. And it's in that instant that she is, has her redemption. And one could say her salvation in a sense. Uh, her true colors come out only in that, you know, few seconds. Um, so a few results from that. So the, the, the misfit knows that. Uh, he says at the end, she would have been a good woman if it was somebody there to shoot her every minute of her life. That's what it took. So the first thing is, um, and this is basically, if you take one thing away, almost, um, what you need to remember about Flannery, um, the channels of grace are unexpected and severe. Um, Flannery would be willing to say, at least for the woman's life, if it took this encounter with the misfit, and her being shot for her to finally be right with God, then it was worth it. And that, in fact, perhaps, um, God might be okay with orchestrating events such that moments of crisis like this lead to that moment of grace. At any rate, grace is severe. Mercy is severe um, in Flannery's worldview. So, you know, the grandmother has her moment of crisis and redemption in that moment. But also what's interesting is the misfit has his moment of crisis and damnation, but not, you know, perhaps, certainly not redemption yet anyway, in that moment. Why is that? What does he say? I wish I'd been there. You know, if, if I had seen it, then I would know, and I wouldn't be the way I am now. And if he did raise the dead, if Christ is, you know, if God is real, and I knew it, I could put my, then I would be different and I would change and I would change my whole life. You know? But he gets proof that that's false. You know? um, how do we know that? Well, he encounters God here. He encounters unmitigated love from the grandmother when she says, you are one of my own children. And she reaches out her hand. So what he's, what Flannery is showing us is that he does encounter the the evidence of Christ's resurrection, and, and not even to put it that too abstractly, you know, in, in the fact of this woman's love, but he encounters a genuine, unselfish, um, I have a kid riding by on a scooter, and now a couple talking out there, sorry to be distracted. Um, he encounters this um, genuine love and rejects it and shoots her three times, which of course is always going to be symbolic, you know, um, 
death thrice over often can be seen as referring to um, Christ, right? Who is in the grave three days. But anyway, if Christ himself showed up to the misfit and reached out his hand and loved him, the misfit would shoot him. At least that appears to be the argument being made here. Although you could also say that, you know, the um, grandmother in doing this sacrifices herself and the misfit in getting his first taste of this um, unfiltered love does turn slightly towards the truth. What do I mean by that? Well, look at the last line of the story. Bobby Lee comes up to him again, um, you know, after, you know, he, the misfit says she would have been a good woman if there'd been somebody there to shoot her every minute of her life. And Bobby Lee says, some fun. Shut up, Bobby Lee, the misfit said. It's no real pleasure in life. And the um, it's, which you see a few times there here, it's no, is um, it's a dialectical difference in certain parts of um, Southern American English. It just means there is, and they would say it is. So it's no real pleasure. It just means there's no real pleasure. So he's now saying, like, he, he just said to the woman, you know, if, if um, I mean, this is, look at this, right? Um, he says, if Christ was, did raise the dead, well, then there's nothing to do but go follow him. And if he didn't, then there's nothing to do but get pleasure out of this life any way you can. Um, shooting somebody or whatever. There's no pleasure but meanness. And then at the end here, he says, there's no real pleasure in life. What does that mean? He has encountered the fact that um, he can't confidently and complacently say that I don't know anymore. He now is forced to make a decision. And that brings us to the crux of Flannery. She's interested in these... Um, spiritual, but that's not quite the right word, moral slash religious uh, crisis points that people are in and, and what it means. So that's about the end for now. That's enough for now anyway. Um, I wish we could talk about it in person because these kind of things get a lot richer with um, real-time interaction. Um, but again, it's good to see your, your forum posts. So remember that, that for Flannery, severe mercy and unexpected channels of grace are going to be um, very key. Uh, that's about it. Uh, there's more there, but whatever. Okay, hope you're all doing okay. Uh, thanks so much for filling out the um, questionnaires, those of you who had, um, and also for just, man, your great work on continuing to read and those sorts of things. As a side note, as we end, um, man, I get it. it you know, even just transitioning in general to summer break or, you know, teaching online for the summer or Christmas break. And for me, I'm, I'm not great at that. And it um, always throws me for a loop, like every year. Um, and this has only been more so. I feel like I'm finally in a good rhythm. Um, but I do understand just the sort of generalized unease and um, distraction that a international less than once in a generation sort of um, crisis like this is. So take care. Hopefully you're in a place with decent weather like it's turning out to be this afternoon in Eugene. Get outside somewhere safe. Get some exercise. Just walk. And um, as always, I'm praying for you all and hope you're doing well. Talk to you later.